Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ms. McGuire online video lecture. And today we're covering human genetics introduction. What is genetic overview of scientific inquiry and scientific method? So this video will be divided into two parts. And in the second part, we will cover scientific inquiry and scientific method. In the first part, we just cover uh, genetics overview. Right. So let's go ahead and begin. Um, by the end of these two lectures, you will be able to explain what genetics is and what it is not, distinguish among gene, exome, and genome, define bioethics, list the levels of genetics, explain how DNA is maintained and how it provides information to construct a protein, explain how mutation can cause a disease, and state the basis of genetic diversity. In addition to that, you will be able to explain the relationship between DNA and chromosomes, distinguish between Mendelian and complex trait, explain how genetics underlies evolution, list some practical uses of DNA information, distinguish between traditional breeding and genetically modifying organisms, explain how investigating genomes extends beyond interest in ourselves. Um, and uh, the last four outcomes are related to scientific method. So you will be able to identify the uh, shared characteristic of all natural sciences, understand the process of scientific inquiry, compare inductive reasoning with deductive reasoning, and describe the goals of basic science and applied science. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin. What is genetics? Genetics is the study of inherited traits and their variations and transmissions. So um, genetic is a scientific study of genes and heredity of how certain qualities of traits are passed from parents to offsprings as a result of changes in DNA sequence. It has recently exploded into a powerful source of information about our identities. Human genetics touches forensics, bioethics, physiology, and even history. Consumer genetics enables anyone to learn about their DNA. So here's example of consumer genetics. Uh, so when you have your uh, genetic test, um, you might be wondering like, okay, uh, what is my ethnicity? So what genetic test can tell you that um, for example, here, I am 42% Italian, 24 European, Swedish, Scottish, right? So you know your ancestry. Um, I have some Native American ancestry as well. I am prone to depression and would respond better to certain drugs than others. I'm at high risk of se um, several cancers. Or I have half brothers and half sisters I don't know about. Uh, and of course, you might be even related to some famous person. Genetics is a life science and should not be confused with genealogy. Genealogy examines how people are related and heredity concerns the transmission of traits and biological information between generations. Certain difficult to define human characteristic might appear to be inherited if they affect several family members, but may reflect shared genetic and environmental influences. Um, so if you're looking at yourself and um, other members of your family, you might find that there is some characteristics that appears in many members of your family. For example, you have brown eyes or blue eyes, You um, you know, all of you are tall, maybe some overweight, right? Is it because of the inherited traits? However, it might be also because of some environmental factors, like obesity, for example, right? So people might be overweight, not because they genetically um, 
uh, have some gene some genetic in them that make them more prominent to gain weight, but just because of their eating and other life habits. Okay, so let's look at some uh, vocabulary of genetics. Genes. So genes are instructions to manufacture proteins and proteins will determine inherited traits. So you all heard about genes and you probably know genes are, you know, what make me me, right? Genes, um, because of my specific genes, I have brown hair or I have um, like um, green eyes or how tall I am, I, that, that, that's your genes, right? But what genes exactly determine, they carry information to make proteins. Now genes are DNA and proteins are another organic molecules um, made of amino acids, right? So genes determine how to make proteins and proteins determine what kind of eye color and hair color and height you will have. Now, genes are composed of DNA. The name for DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. A genome is a complete set of genetic information. A cell is the basic unit of life containing two genomes. Now, why would cell contain two genomes? Because if we're talking about um, eukaryotic cells, right, and they, um, re, uh, let's say the cell um, reproduced by dividing into two other cells, then each cell will get, um, well, let, let me put this way, just make it more clear. So, let me get a pencil uh, that does not disappear. Okay, so for example, you know, all humans started with one single cell. So here's our first cell called, oops, it's still disappearing. So that's the first cell, right? That starts, uh, so this cell is formed when sperm, fertilize an egg, right? So here you have sperm and you have egg. They unite together to make a very first cell. Now this cell will have genome from a mother cell, from an egg, and from a father cell, from a sperm. Right? That's why it says that a cell that is a basic unit of life has two genomes. Now what is exome? So exome is a part of genome that encodes proteins. Genomics compares and analyzes function of many genes. And bioethics addresses issue and controversies that arise in applying medical technology and using genetic information, right? So make sure you understand what genes are. Genes are DNA that code for proteins. Genome is complete cell of genetic information. Cell is a basic unit of life, uh, contains two genomes. Exome is a part of genome that encodes proteins because really not all your DNA encodes for proteins. You have a part of DNA that is responsible for regulation of uh, protein synthesis. But the ones that specifically respond to protein synthesis called exome. Genomics, when we compare many genes. I, okay, so let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Genetic uh, considers the transformation of information at several levels. It begins with molecular level and broadens through cells, tissues, organs, individuals, families, and finally to population and to the evolution of species. So when we talk about genetics, we apply it to a several uh, levels, right? It's not just applied to individual, you and me, 
right? We can talk about uh, cell genetics, about organ genetics, right? Uh, the whole popu popu genetics of populations and genetics of species. A DNA molecule resembles a spiral staircase or double helix. So DNA is double helix. So let's look at its structure on our next slide. So here is the structure of DNA. Most of the human DNA is located inside nucleus. DNA is organized into structure called chromatin and chromatin uh, form chromosomes, right? So here's a DNA, it's double helix. Uh, a part of DNA that codes for protein is called gene. Then it has a uh, very precise uh, organization. So it wraps itself around a structure called histones, making chromosomes. And we have chromosomes inside uh, nucleus of eukaryotic cells. Um, so DNA um, is made of uh, phosphate, sugar, and base. And we have four bases, adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine. The information that a DNA molecule imparts is in the sequence of A, T, C, and G. The chemical structure of DNA gives it two key abilities essential for being the basis of life. So why DNA is basis of life? What are those abilities of DNA that make it so suitable to carry on li all life functions? First, DNA can replicate itself. Because if, if DNA wouldn't be able to replicate, then you cannot make more DNA, so cells cannot divide and pass this DNA to daughter cells. And the second um, is that it's accessible to manufacture protein, right? So remember, not DNA is not just, um, uh, you know, everybody probably heard about DNA, their blueprint of life. But when we say DNA is a blueprint of life, we don't really understand what it means. But it means that only DNA, right, can, um, can, uh, ensures that life continues. So life cannot continue without DNA. If you have a cell with, uh, with some other molecules, if they don't have DNA, when they die, you would not have new cells. But because DNA can replicate, that means we can make another DNA from existing DNA. We can pass it to new cells. So we can pass it to one generation, from one generation to another generation. And because DNA code for proteins, uh, we will use it, your cells will use it to make proteins and proteins will uh, build most of the uh, tissue in your body and they will <clears throat> direct all the cellular processes or perform all the cellular processes. Now, let me see, I forgot if I have structure of DNA over here. Yes, that's why I, I didn't really um, explain much about structure because we can look over here. Now, you see this green structure, that's a sugar. Um, attached to the sugar uh, is phosphate base. And uh, another part attached to sugar is, um, so that's a phosphate, I'm sorry, not a base. This is nitrogenous base over here. All right, so if I would draw um, one nucleotide, so I would draw a sugar, I would draw a phosphate group and nitrogenous base, right? So here is a sugar, that's a phosphate, and this is nitrogenous base. And DNA has four of these bases, right? So it can be either adenine or it can be uh, cytosine, guanine, or thymine. And then if you look over here, we have one helix, Right, sugar, phosphate, and base, and it's attached to another nucleotide with sugar, uh, phosphate, and base. So here's a sugar, phosphate, and base, right, and so on. 
So it makes this what we call phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, backbone, and nitrogenous bases. And nitrogenous bases form um, chemical bonds between complementar complementary nitrogenous base. And uh, A always pairs with T, and C always pairs with G. And that's how we create double helix. From gene to protein. In DNA replication, a new double helix is formed from the old one using free DNA bases. So DNA, remember, it can replicate itself. That means it can make identical copy of a DNA. And we form a new DNA, right, using the old one as a template. Thus, the two daughter cells inherit identical copies of the genome during cell division. Now, transcription copies the DNA information into a related molecule called messenger ribonucleic acid or messenger RNA. This process is also called gene expression. So gene expression is the process when we make copy of a gene from DNA and this copy of gene now uh, encoded in the messenger RNA. So we, we make mRNA from DNA, that's gene expression. Then translation uses the information in messenger RNA to assemble amino acid into proteins. Proteins provide the traits associated with genes. All right, so on this diagram, you can see that our goal over here to make this protein. So that might be a transport protein or it can be a receptor protein, some important molecule over here that is inside the cell membrane. So that's a cell membrane and this blue structure is protein. Now, how your cells making this protein? Well, your cell, this cell has chromosomes. So for example, this is chromosome number seven. In the chromosome number seven, we have uh, a gene. So gene is the, uh, the uh, it's a DNA, right? It's a specific part of DNA that code for protein. So here we have a gene that is made of DNA. Through process of transcription, we're gonna make a copy of this gene. And this copy will be mRNA. Because look, DNA is double helix. DNA is a really large molecule. So that's a huge molecule with many, many genes. But you need just specific gene to make this one specific protein. That's why you make a copy of one gene, call it mRNA. And from mRNA through the process called translation, we're gonna make this protein. Proteins are made from amino acids. Now, mutation is a, in a gene is a change, right? So a change in a gene is mutation, and it can have an effect at the whole person level. Alleles are variants of gene, and they inherited or arise by mutation. So how to explain what allele is and how it is different from a gene? So just, it's going to be analogy, right? That's, of course, not a true example. Analogy just help you to understand the material, right? So imagine that gene is a car, right? So, for example, you have a car, right? And this car is a gene. Now, what kind of car you have? Well, for example, I have a Chevy, Chevy Cruiser. That will be allele of this particular gene. Or somebody have BMW. It's also a car, right? Or somebody has Hyundai. That's also, that's going to be allele. So allele kind of, it's different variation of the same gene. For example, now a real example. Let's say a gene is uh, eye color. 
right? But it doesn't tell you much. You know, there is a gene in your chromosomes that determine eye color, but allele would be a brown color, blue color, green color, right? So those different alleles for the same gene. And they those alleles arise from mutations. Mutation in sperm or egg cells are passed to the next generation. Mutation may be positive, negative, or neutral. And actually, if I would ask you, what do you think is the most common mutations? Most common mutations are neutral. Here's an example of harmful mutation. Cystic fibrosis is a disease, um, CF is abbreviation, that illustrates how a missing or abnormal protein causes the symptoms in an inherited disease. In CF, the protein in the cystic, uh, in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator that's the name of the protein, right? Very, you know, uh, long name. So it's uh, CFTR. And TR stands for transmembrane um, conductance regulator. The functioning protein works like a selective doorway in cells lining the airways and other parts and can cause a thickening secretion when it doesn't work properly. And let's, let's just look at the picture. First, it tells you the symptoms uh, of cystic fibrosis, like uh, inflammation, infection, polyps of the sinuses, your airways are affected, um, uh, respiratory infection, it damages liver and pancreas and intestine and reproductive tract and skin, right? So many organs are affected by cystic fibrosis because uh, of the mutation in a gene. So let's look at the mutation first and then we get, oh, let, let's, let's go back, sorry. Um, so disease, the disease cystic fibrosis is caused by mutation in a, uh, CFTR gene. The mutation causes the replacement of the amino acid glycine with aspartic acid at a specific site. So uh, when we make a protein, proteins are made of amino acids. We have 20 different amino acids that make functional proteins. In this particular mutation, one amino acid is replaced by a different amino acid. That is the wrong amino acid for this protein. This alters the CFTR protein so that it cannot open at the cell surface and difficulty breathing, impaired digestion, and other symptoms result from this mutation. So if, if you look over here, and so that's a very um, nice diagram that will explain us how this mutation works. So that's our normal um, protein. So you see, that's a cell. So imagine this cell is in your respiratory tract, right? In your bronchi, right? So the cell has a cell membrane. And here you have a nice protein that is open and it's allow substances to move out of the cell, specifically chloride ions, right? So it's open and everything works fine. Now to make this protein, these cells need instructions, right? So where is the instruction how to make this protein? Well, it's actually in DNA, in a specific gene. And, and sequence of DNA over here, C, C, and A. Now remember to make this protein, first you need to make messenger RNA. So C always pairs with, uh, uh, with G. So you, you make, instead of C, you will have G, instead of C, you will have G. And A actually pairs with T, but because RNA doesn't have T, it pairs with U. And this G, G, U codes for glycine. That's amino acid, right? So your cell is reading instruction. So you put uh, serine, you put glycine, you put glutamine, and, you know, and many, many others amino acids to make functional protein. Now, a person is born with a defected gene. 
Now look what happened. In a gene, instead of this C, somebody has T, right? Now to make this protein, we need to make mRNA, C pairs with G, but T pairs with A, and A pairs with U. So you see this shown in red, that's a mutation. Now instead of glycine, your cell's gonna put a different amino acid, aspartic acid, and make this protein, but now it's closed. Look, it's not open. So the sodium cannot move out of the cell. And when this happened, we're not going into detail how exactly is sodium related to a sick mucus on the surface, right? But just because something doesn't work inside the cell, the whole organ is not working properly. So that person have what is called cystic fibrosis. Chromosomes and more. Chromosomes consist of DNA and proteins. When the cell is not dividing, the chromosomes are unwound and in a structure called a nucleus. Somatic cells in humans have 23 chromosome pairs. Um, 23 pairs. So somatic cells is a, just a regular cell of your body, right? And you get every cell in your body, get 23 chromosomes from your mom and 23 from dad, right? That's called somatic cells. Now, 22 pairs are autosomes and one pair are sex chromosomes. So females have two X chromosomes and males have X and Y chromosome. And... Um, Karyotypes display the chromosome pairs from largest to smallest. Now, what is karyotype? Karyotype is really a picture of your chromosomes and they arranged in specific order from the biggest chromosome to a smallest chromosome. So you can see over here that um, we have, um, they're not, they're not connected right there, right? This is just chromosome number one, All right? So you have two chromosome number one, two chromosomes number two, two chromosomes three, two chromosomes four, and so on and so on, right? And then um, this, this person has X and X chromosomes, so that's female. So here we have 22 pairs of autosomes and one a pair of uh, sex chromosomes. A trait caused predominantly by a single gene is termed Mendelian. Um, so, and it's named uh, after Gregor Mendel, who discovers a pattern of trait transmission. So, if you have a trait, for example, your uh, earlobes. So, if you look at your earlobes, and if they is a free or attached, there is only one single gene that determine what type of ear lobes you have, then it's a Mendelian trait. Um, however, Mendelian trait, sorry. However, most characteristic are complex traits. They are determined by one or more genes and environmental factors. So usually complex traits are determined by more than one gene plus envir environmental factors. The more factors that contribute to a trait or illness, inherited or environmental, the more difficult it is to predict the risk of occurrence in a particular family member. So it's easy when we predict the geno uh, genotype of a, uh, of a baby if we're looking at uh, a Mendelian traits. But when we're looking at complex traits, it's difficult to make that prediction. So for example, over here, we can see that uh, polydactyly, when somebody has uh, six fingers instead of five, that's a Mendelian trait. So it's a, just one single gene. So if you, you can make a pedigree, you can see how this polydactyly runs in the family and you can make a prediction. Uh, if a baby will be born with five or six fingers, right? However, if you look at hair color of this girl, the hair color is determined by at least three different genes. So that that's gonna be um, more difficult to predict what hair color baby gonna have. 
So that's uh, hair color is complex trait and polydactyly is Mendelian trait. Um, so human body consists of approximately 30 trillion cells. Cells differ in appearance and activities because they use only some of their genes. You know, like when I just told you, we all started with one single cell, right? That's called zygote. So if, if we started with one cell, the cell, every cell in your body has the same genetic information, but cells still very different. So how does this happen? Because cells undergo differentiation or specialization of a distinctive cell types. That means cells do not use all of their genes. They use only some of their genes, right? Stem cells. Stem cells divide to yield other stem cells and cells that differentiate, right? So these cells will go through differentiation. Tissues are a group of cells with a shared function. Genotype refers to underlying DNA structures, alleles present. Phenotype is a visible trait, biochemical change, or effect on health, allele expressed. So uh, my genotype, for example, I can say like, well, I am heterozygous for, um, I don't know, I'm heterozygous for, um, like hairline, right? So my hairline is straight. So I can be homozygous or heterozygous for this particular trait. That's going to be my genotype, right? But my phenotype is what you actually um, can see, uh, right? That's observable trait. That's my genotype that was expressed. Now, those alleles, remember each gene has at least two alleles. So for every single gene in your cells, you always have two alleles. It's like if you have a car, you always have two cars, right? So that's good. Right? So for hair color, I have at least two alleles. For my um, for my height, I have at least two alleles. However, hair color and, and height are um, it, determined by several genes, right? But each gene has two alleles. Uh, so in your body, each gene has two alleles. My body, every single gene is made of two alleles. It can be same. Alleles can be the same or can be different. So alleles also can be dominant when they exerting an effect of a single copy. That means just one allele of a dominant gene is enough to be expressed in phenotype. Or recessive, that requiring two copies for expression. Now, pedigrees are charts that depict the members of family and indicate which individuals have particular inherited uh, traits. So here's a representation of a pedigree. So, for example, that's you. And we use circles for female. And here's the parents. That's a mom. That's a dad. So... Uh, we have 50% of uh, DNA from mom, 50 from dad. Then if you look at your grandparents, you have 25% of DNA from your grandparents, 125 from, from great-grandparents, and 625 from great-great-grandparents. <clears throat> the bigger picture from population to evolution. Above the family level, of genetic organization is a population. In a strict biological sense, population is a group of individuals that can have healthy offsprings together. In a genetic sense, population is a large collection of alleles distinguished by their frequencies. Genetic um, populations are defined by their collection of alleles termed the gene pool. So if you're looking at, of course, we, you know, we are individuals, right? We have our own um, genetic composition, right? But we live in the population. 
um, we, we don't use kind of we don't use species species I guess to, uh, when we talk about uh, human genetics we just use population so in the population uh, we can marry other member of a population and we can have kids with that person right um, so that's what determine population in a genetic sense however population is a gene pool of all the alleles so if for example, we have 10 people, um, right? Just let's take like very small population. So for example, we just have 10 people. So if you if you take all the alleles from these uh, people and kind of imagine that we're gonna put those alleles, right? All their, you know, DNA in one pool, that's gonna be a gene pool of that population of 10 people. Genome, a comparison among species uh, reveal evolutionary relationship. So if we um, if we compare gene pool of different population, we can say how closely they are related to each other. Genetics is impacting. Let me see. Sometimes I think I'm skipping slides. So genetics is impacting several areas of our lives, from health, care choices to what we eat to unraveling our past and um, guiding our futures. Citizen scientists are discovering genetic information about themselves while helping researchers complete a genomic database. Thinking about genetics evokes fear, hope, anger, wonder, and despair, depending on context and circumstances. This has to do is how DNA information is used. Comparing DNA sequences among individuals can rule out identity, relationship, or ancestry, or indicate the probability that two individuals are related, right? So if you compare your DNA and DNA of another person, you can say like, oh, we can be cousins, right? Or even maybe sisters or brothers. DNA profiling refers to the technique, statistical analysis, and machine-leading approaches used to compare DNA sequences between and among individuals. So what is DNA profiling? That's when we use different techniques and analyze DNA uh, similarities and differences between individuals. Used most often in a, a context of forensic science. So for example, you know, somebody was, um, uh, I don't know, killed, right? Or the um, somebody left a finger, well, not fingerprints there, of course, it's not DNA analysis, but like some body fluid, saliva or blood, right? So we can use, um, DNA profiling to find out more about that person and maybe even um, you know find who that person was. So that's a forensic science. Also, DNA profiling useful in identifying victims of natural disasters. And another use, in, use is to analyze foods to determine authenticity or government items. So we can, of course, we, we don't need uh, to do DNA profiling only on human population, right? We can uh, study DNA of plants as well. Uh, DNA analysis is a time machine of sorts. DNA evidence may confirm findings from anthropology and history or contradict it. DNA testing can provide views into past epidemics. Analysis of DNA in the mummy of the Egyptian king Tutankhamun revealed that the boy king likely died from complication of malaria and nothing else, right? So how would we, how we, would we even know what happened with this uh, uh, boy king, right, that lived so many hundred years ago? Right, but if we analyze um, his DNA and do DNA testing, we can even learn that, you know, what happened, what kind of diseases were 
prevalent that time. Why this boy king died? Well, he died from malaria. DNA analysis confirmed that President Thomas Jefferson had children with his slave Sally Hemings, and today the extended family holds reunion, right? How would we know it? Look, look at this beautiful, beautiful family over here, right? And you know, I would know that I, th I think all of us have families uh, big like this. We just don't know some of our relatives. And wouldn't it be nice to have like family reunion of a people who never even expected to be related? Um, of course, there is some um, uh, controversy and lots of conversation about genetics. So combining um, analysis of genetic diversity with reproductive technologies creates a way to rebuild populations that are uh, headed towards extinction. So um, that means, well, what if we have some plants or animals that are on, on their path towards extinction. So they're gonna disappear soon. Do you think we should use their genetics and rebuild this population? I don't know, that's again, a lots of controversy <laughs> um, uh, happens when we talk about genetics. Um, but they, they're using it. This is the case for northern white rhinoceros of Africa. Researchers are working on ways to bring back the species by borrowing from the genomes of the subspecies. That's interesting, right? So if a species that disappears, uh, can we bring them back because we have their DNA preserved? Um, another way to use genetics, it will be in medicine. In several nations, people are um, volunteering to have their genome sequenced so that researchers can learn more about health and disease. Um, evaluating genetic data is a large part of uh, precision medicine, which is tailoring of treatments to individuals. The microbiome is a symbiotic relationship between an individual genome, diet, lifestyle factors, lifestyle factors, and the many microbes in the body. Pharmacogenetics um, considers gene variants to predict whether a specific drug will be effective or cause side effects in an individual. So that's another application of genetics. So let's I just go just go back for a second just so we don't don't um lost the track of what we're doing over here um so we're talking about application of genetics and genomics so how we use it why do we need it right so we can we said that it can be used to establish identity through dna profiling to eliminate, uh, illuminate history so we can learn more about history, to, um, to conserve the species so we can um, save species that are close to be extinct, um, to make a better medication, um, right, to um, also modify some organism <laughs> and uh, make them maybe better suitable to our needs. So genetic modification means altering a gene or genome in a way that does not occur in nature. Genetically mod modified organism, GMOs and drugs have been available for many years. They arise from recombinant DNA technology, which adds a gene from a different species. Well, we all heard about GMOs, and there is a lot of controversy about GMOs as well. But how it works when you have um, the organism, for example, you have uh, strawberry, right? So strawberry is a, a plant that has its own um, DNA, right? So if we can add a gene, 
from uh, some species that are resistant to cold, for example. And I think what they did with strawberries, they used a gene from a fish that live in a cold Arctic water. So they take this gene that make fish resistant to cold and they inserted it in DNA of strawberries. So that we get recombinant DNA and that why many strawberries right now are more resistant to cold. There is a newer technology called genome edit editing that can replace, remove, or add specific genes into the cell of any organism. And most talked about tool is CRISPR-Cas9 system. What this does, um, and we will, you know, we will talk about this uh, CRISPR uh, a little bit more in detail, but what this does, you can, for example, if somebody has a gene for cystic fibrosis, right? Broken gene for cystic fibrosis that we just discussed. What if we can cut out that defective gene and replace it with normal gene? Then the baby is born without the disease, right? That's a really promising uh, technology. And right now it's, we just, we're just learning about it, right? It's not widely used yet, but it might be our future. Uh, exome sequencing. Exome sequencing determines the order of the DNA basis of all part of the genome that encode proteins. The information is compared to database that lists many gene variants, alleles, and their association with specific phenotypes such as diseases. Exome sequencing is uh, valuable in identifying extremely rare diseases and used uh, to be years, not a matter of hours, to do this, uh, that sequences. Right. So what it tells us here that if we make, um, if we determine all our uh, sequences for all our genes, right, and um, specifically the ones that encodes for protein, that we will really know what um, mutation in which particular gene causes um, this or that disease. Like, for, for example, if we take a cancer, right? If a person has a cancer, let's say ovarian cancer, if we can compare the exome or of the person who doesn't have a cancer. So if we look at all, all these genes that code for proteins in the person who doesn't have cancer and the person who has cancer, we will be able to find out which gene is affected, right? So we know exactly where this problem is. Global perspective on um, uh, genomes. We share the planet with many thousands of other species. Many of these we cannot grow in a lab. Metagenomics is a field that involves sequencing of all of the DNA in the habitat, so not only human uh, DNA. Shows how species interact and may yield new drugs and reveal novel energy sources. The first metagenomic project described life in the Sargasso Sea. So when we not only uh, sequencing DNA of a particular population, but actually all populations that live in a, this uh, exact habitat. Um, efforts are underway to limit genetic uh, prospecting. Genetics is a special branch of life sci of science, uh, branch of life science, because it affects us intimately. Social, uh, social issues that parallel scientific progress, equal access to genetic tests and treatments, uh, misuse of genetic information, abuse of genetics to cause harm, right? So, um, so what it tells us that, of course, there is many efforts that, that to stop this genetic progress because we don't know how it's going to be used. Uh, if we can treat genetic diseases, okay, well, that's one thing. But what if we can make people different, maybe uh, some way better? What if rich people can afford to 
um, kind of go over. So, for example, they want to have a baby and they have enough money to go and test this baby that just embryo right now and test everything that baby will have. How tall the baby will be when he or she grows up. Right. What color of hair, what color of eyes, what shape of a nose, uh, shape of the lips, right? Well, a condition of the skin, what what type of, what blood type the baby will have, what will be um, cholesterol level, right? So everything, they can test everything because they have money and then they can fix everything, making those super babies without, you know, any flosses, without any diseases, without any... I mean, just super beautiful, strong, healthy people, right? And what if it's only, uh, you know, only if you have money you can do it, then how about most of the people, right? So that's that's talking about changing the baby, but even if it's treatment and uh, the treatment of the diseases, right? Will we all have equal access to it or not? Right. Then how this information can be used? What be, if somebody will use it in their advantages, right? Or they use it to cause harm to other people. So lots, lots of issue uh, because of this um, perspective on genomes. Uh, genetics and genomics are... Uh, spoiling technologies that may vastly improve the quality of life. Human genome information has tremendous potential for the entire globe. World organizations are discussing how nations can share new diagnostic tests and therapeutics. Individual nations are adopting guidelines to use genetic information to suit their strengths. Bioethics discusses instances when genetic testing can affect privacy, right? And that's um, that was the last slide for this lecture. As I said, I will record the second one where we cover uh, scientific method, but this was brief, brief introduction to genetics. Um, so please make sure to watch this lecture again. It was a pretty long, cover lots of information. Now, when you're watching this video lecture, have a pencil and a pen and make notes, right? That would be very helpful during your quizzes, exams, and other assignments. Okay, well, thank you for watching. I hope it was helpful and I talk to you again next time.